Morning. <coughs> Why well, have one brush when two, four, six, eight, nine will do? This is the one I'm currently using. These are this is still in good condition, this one, but I cut the handle a bit too short. Still works. This one's very worn. That one's very worn. You can see where well you can see that's uh, that's one or two of these split it's a bit quite badly. Looks like there's some hair has been pulled out of this one, but I don't know, I'm quite gentle with them really. These are quite cheap ones I bought in uh, DIY stores. They do different things, not that I ever use them. This one is, is the original one we used to use for the Ron Manson. The, 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 the bristles are, are quite a bit shorter and it doesn't come into a lovely chisel edge that, that does, so I might have even trimmed that up, I don't, perhaps not. This is a three inch height which I don't use and that's a, no, well, one, that's a, a new one uh, as a reserve so that's how they come so I'll take those off. I tried to, I'm trying to alter my setup a little bit to uh, allow me to have the board excuse me when I put in my, my hay pot uh, whoops, do that. Sorry about this. Okay, never throw anything away. Uh, I've got this board at about 20 degrees. Let's bring it up a little bit to about 30 degrees, which is the ideal position for it. Now I've, I've swapped my easel to the from my Mabeth box easel to this uh, steel. I think it's a uh, John Herring easel, Frank Herring easel. Herring is a very famous art supplies, art material shop in Dorchester and a young friend of ours used to live next door married the son and he does the framing and she looks after the shop and it's a wonderful place. If you get a chance to go to Dorchester if you live in Dorchester at any time, call in, call in and say hello to Sarah. Um, um, and Paul and the dad, John, lovely, lovely oldie worldy type business started by the grandfather and they now sell things like uh, spinning machines for, for making home spun stuff, uh, any range of art material and they've got a gallery upstairs, super place, highly recommended and uh, that's the easel I think that was designed for the herrings. Uh, or it might be a, a similar type, but it's got it's a, it's not that portable. It's quite heavy. It's not aluminium. It's steel, but very sturdy. Very sturdy. Let's see if I can get that tighter. So the way I spell. Right, it's quite high up for me. I'd like it a little bit. I've, I'm sitting on a on a, a swivel stool here. I don't like to stand up doing my paintings. But I'm just really experimenting or going back to what I used to do, the angle I used to do with a board that was, was, uh, wasn't was fixed and I prop it up on a, on, a, on a table, I've got a big table to my right and you could tilt it so you could get the, the water, the wet washers going wherever you wanted them to, to, to blend one way or the other, down or back up. There was quite a bit of variety but, but filming with my camcorder is a bit limited for a couple of reasons. Mainly, I can't pause in record and carry on, so I have to make either one, two, two or three parts, or knit them all together on the Windows Movie Maker, which all takes time. And uh, so that's why we do that. But what I would like to get eventually is a, is a camera that doesn't do all the things that the camcorder does, like photo mode so you can so it's an all-purpose camera very good camera uh, but I just want to just a camera does nothing other than than record in a good in a good format a good good definition widescreen of course and can pause in record so you can go and have a cup of tea come back press it start again without any break in your recording uh, so suggestions please 
But I'm not ready to ditch this one yet because it's got, it's got a lot of life left in it. Although I've recorded about 1200 videos on it. I've taken umpteen photographs, but we've got cameras that take, like our, our phones take lovely pictures, easy enough to download. Right, I, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. I, it's going to be a made up one. I've got nothing in mind really other than talking to Stephen Cronin about the, we're living in in an urban or suburban situation. We're rather limited for vistas on our doorstep other than parkland, which is rather sterile for, for, for artists anyway, great for photographers. But we like rough ground, rough with plenty of scope for for um, dry brush effects, bushes, trees, mystery, lovely skies. Um, we, we both like water in our paintings, even if it's water in a, in a, in a muddy in a muddy or on a muddy footpath. So without more ado, enough yak from me. I always turn my water bottle round, water pot round. I like a big water pot like that. Can you see? Oops, where are we? Ooh, there we are. Here's my water pot. It's probably about two or three litres big. So I, I've got plenty of clean water, but I change it every, more or less every painting. Right, okay. I've tried to have the camera on the right, but it doesn't seem to, to give a nice angle on the on the paper. This is Fabriano, £130. So I've left a couple of unpainted bits, unwet bits, but the water won't run down quite so fierce, so steep. Right, we've got um, lemon yellow, raw sienna, alizarin crimson, light red, ultramarine, burnt amber, paint spray, burnt sienna. But I'm going to try using more, more burnt sienna. I don't use a lot of it. So just a bit of a warm with uh, some raw sienna. And when the hake splits, just tip it in the water and just bring it back together again. So I was reading one of my Ron Ransom books in bed this morning. <laughs> Earphones in. Um, ah, no, I'm short of a bit of cloth now. Okay. Right, cloth. Um, reading for the umpteenth time about uh, the techniques of big brush watercolour and why we use the hake. I'm just going to move the wood up there so I can put my my paint tray there uh, by the side of me. Right, uh, I'll go back to what I was thinking of in a minute. So a bit of blue, a bit of, bit of light red. Don't be too sloppy because there's plenty of water on the paper. A bit more of a shadowy cloud at the top. Right, that, that'll do, that's, that's interesting enough. So we'll uh, put that to one side. Yeah, the reason we, that, that Ron Ranson hit on the, the hake all these years ago, is it, it's not a Chinese brush, it's a Japanese watercolour brush. I want to move, move my, look, look at these, these are my acrylic brushes. Put those there, my little mannequin. Uh, right, okay. Put my cloth somewhere, I don't like holding my cloth, it makes my fingers go all dry. And a little, a little nick in, the, in your thumbs and it lasts, goes on forever. Right, so you can see that the, the, though the paint's going down the paper, it's not sort of falling off. So I'm going to give that a dry, I'm going to fix that. Yeah, the reason for the, for the hake... ...is it does a lot of things, but the one thing you can't do with it is to fiddle. And this is a big problem with when you start out painting, is to fiddle and fuss and poke and prod 
and try to do too much and it looks amateurish right now I'm going to put some some pigment on there um, I don't want it to go down too much I'm going to alter the angle of that a bit and I'm going to do a bit, bit of background a bit of the sky color in the back so let's see what happens to that a bit heavier more with the blue Uh, this is a bit of background and nothing any great difficulty there the thing is it's now staying more or less where I put it now we'll add some lemon yellow which is tainted with a bit of grey from yesterday So I just put that in and then we can put a bit of warm with a bit of bit of umber. The umber still hasn't dried. I put it out a couple of days ago and it's still I will have a bit of a bit of path there. A bit of paint is grey, I think, a bit of blue, just get some texture in this. Just a patch of patch of ground, rough ground, because rough ground is a lot more interesting than the manicured lawns. Right, let's put in some harder bushes now. More or less neat paint there. Apart from that here, that's. Uh, oh. A bit of lemon, a bit of yellow. Just having, having fun with the hake. Put a bit of a break there, maybe. using the corner of the brush to put in the foliage and then while that dries, that dries. <coughs> See this, the sky has more or less stayed where I put it. A little bit cramped for a bit. I've removed my box easel because if I can get away with that heron easel for a while, I'll be more than happy. It'll take up less wind. Right, that's better. Now, I hope I'm with the camera. Uh, right, now while that's, uh, that's done, I'll just put it tight again. Yeah, the, the thing about when you, as beginners, it's so easy to to overwork a painting and especially foregrounds but we can start to lift out a bit of the uh, light catching on the some trunks in the in the background um, can you see that just lifting that's a bit wet there so still wet could be silver birches just in amongst the general muddle of the background. But if the paint's too wet, it will infill in the groove again that you're making. I'll wait for that to. Ah, oh, that's taking. Right, okay. Like, now we'll start to text, texture some of this in in here. You see we've got greens. Now, now the paper's drying a little bit. We can put in these nice warm colours and leave a bit of sparkle. We can put some bushes in this. 
bit of bit of um, uh, ultramarine, and you could scrape out a few grasses in that and put in a bit of bit of nice scrubby bush here and there. This is all just basic painting at the moment. There's some over here. I don't want all this all wet in wet, but if you're painting over over wet paint and you want your paint to actually your next coat to stick, you could have really use it thick like that. That it will stay where it's put. It's, it's easier when you're working straight from the tube paint. because you've got wet paint to begin with. Some of these paints on here you have to scrub away a bit. Uh, okay, so we're just texturing. This is sort of a turning into a tutorial in basic techniques of brushing wet. Uh, right, now while that's uh, going off, we'll just put in some grasses. In our local, one of our local parks, probably about four miles, five miles away, we do the bike ride along the Wandle, in the Wandle Valley, that's a river. Well, excuse for a river. But we might do with what we've got, and we're more than grateful for it. Um, there's this boardwalk that's been put in place, it's owned by the National Trust. And they've spent a lot of money, probably lottery funding, on this boardwalk through the, what they call the wetlands. And there's lots of uh, grasses, bulrushes, wonderful trees, and although it's surrounded by suburbia, it is beautiful and, and you can puzzle away how you're going to show grasses in watercolour without drawing you can draw but you can do it with, with with this but the danger with these sort of things is that you, you can overuse them but I'm quite liking that I hope you are uh, so we've, we've got our, our more dry brush in the foreground and we'll put even more on, on that in a minute but we've got our, our nice uh, I'm going to try that. Got a, a nice uh, wet in wet, but we're now going to put some hard stuff in some some little trees, shrubby trees. I'm not going to do great big oaks and things. Stephen Cronin, I would highly recommend it, especially if you're a beginner. Mainly because we both like the similar subjects, we both paint in totally different ways. He's been doing this on YouTube a lot longer than I have, but oh, he's six years ahead of me. But I'm a few years ahead of him with this method. I've, I've been using the Hake with a gap of 15 years for 30 odd years. The book that I was reading this morning was published in 1984, so not that long after that, probably two or three years after that, I got onto the Ron Ranson technique, but I abandoned watercolour painting when I made very good friends with a guy that was a, a redundant diamond mounter, and because of his eye for detail, fine detail, he... Uh, was very good at painting. He took it up late in life, like most of us. And but his technique was very tight. 
But he got me into water colour painting, to kidding me there. But water colour painting wasn't really serious, not like oil painting. But it is, it's, it's, it's gorgeous. Oh, I didn't put some bushes in there, in here, here, just, just off centre. I don't want to lose my path there. Um, so I, so I abandoned the watercolour and did uh, oil painting to, with some success, I have to say, commercial success, but, but I haven't seen him for a while and we, I've gone back to to watercolour painting and acrylic painting and a bit of knife painting now with oil mainly because of the solvents I didn't like the solvents it doesn't agree with me make me cough okay so there we are just a bit of, bit of warm in that middle distance here I do a bit of rigor work as well it's all very delicate but it looks as if I've done a lot of painting there but all I've done is just use the edge of the hake. So we can put that all across there. No, I don't want to disturb that bit there. I'm just going to go up here. Have a look. By the time I put some rigor work in there. I want some of that yellow background to show through. There is an area near, near here called Beddington Farm. It's an old, uh, very low lying, and slowly it's been built on sadly, but but the tracks along it, with all this sort of rough ground, but it's not open, it will be. They've done a lot of uh, quarrying for aggregate and, and gravel and pits. And And it's all being flooded with the lovely lakes and then one day it's going to be open to the public. Right now I want to do some dark green now. Just to put in a little bit along here. Okay. Right now I'm going to do some work with the rigger. Not a lot, the little goes a long way, but the river is a superb brush. It's uh, number three, Dale Rowney. Uh, I don't know what series, but it's a lovely brush and it's nylon. But um, my people practice in, I'll show you, um, I'll show you a bit of grey, a bit of Payne's grey. Now you can get all these very fine, fine lines but with a bit of water on it you can get a quite a thick tapering line so the rigger although it was originally designed to do just that paint rigging the old boats in the, in the olden days we use it now for most of our fine work and our bit of detail work so that's what we're going to use now just going to use a bit of burnt umber and a bit of paint grey So it's sort of a warm dark and we just put in some of this. Along here. Don't like that bit there, so we'll just take that out. Any more? Okay, now I want a bit of bushy stuff in here, so uh, let's do that with a rigger. Okay, I'm going to, I nearly don't know what I'm going to do on that, but I'll put a bit of a... A little bit of reflection 
in that muddy Right, I'll put a couple of little figures in there, a couple of birds. It's quite an old picture, this. But, uh, quite like it. It's a dark figure because it won't sharp against here. Let's walk out there. Let's put a bit of a shadow there. Path going somewhere out there. Okay, put a couple of birds in. Give a signature. I'll put in a mount. We'll see what it looks like. Right, let's put that on there. So it doesn't fall off. Although this board is quite flat, I prefer working at this angle because I'm not sure how you can find it. Uh, just tilt the board a bit and bring it around. Okay, the old uh, water now. I'll just put this in the, put it in the blue now. Sorry. No, I won't. I'll put it in the light now. I like the light now. So I'll call this rough ground, I think, because that's what it is. I, I do love it. It's, it's bags, of, as Evil Besson would say, bags of damn all. It's a uh, bit of heathland, rough ground, anywhere really. I like the sky. I like the sky because the because it was flatter. The red and the blue have separated, and it's given this slightly grainy effect. The thicker paint you use, the more it will granulate, and it's a lovely effect. I've always loved it. Uh, right. Okay. Well, there we are. Rough ground. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed that. Bye bye.